Thank you very much indeed, Ed. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. It's a pleasure to be here at the centennial year of the American Scandinavian Foundation. Congratulations with 100 years of building bridges between Scandinavia and the United States. Very happy to see my family here today, Ray Dun Rubert, uh, their son, uh, to see uh, the Consul General, to see uh, many friends uh, from uh, here in New York that I, where I spent good years when I uh, worked for the United Nations. Uh, indeed, uh, perhaps the best year I had as a student and, the, and my best years was as a student, the best year was the one at Berkeley. And I couldn't have done it without the um, Wiegeland uh, Award from the American Scandinavian Foundation. It helped me uh, spend a year at a, a campus like nothing they would have in Scandinavia. I learned a lot, and I have uh, since come back to this country uh, regularly ever since. The question we're asking tonight <clears throat> basically is, what's happened in this 100 years of ASF? Has the world become better? How has the world changed? And I'd like to, um, to try to convince you, I hope you can see the, the screen. If you cannot, please move to, to, to so you can. Um, I, will, I hope to be able to convince you that indeed the world has become much better for the vast majority of us, but at the same time there are a lot of remaining enormous challenges, um, and among them uh, perhaps the biggest, uh, in my view, climate change. But first, population. How has the world changed? Well, this is a good image of, of us, humankind, at this planet now. It's made by the um, uh, Geo uh, National Geographic magazine. You see a lot of color, a lot of light, it means a lot of people. You will see that hardly anybody live in Norway, my country, or, or, or for that matter, most of Scandinavia. And you will see that uh, it's really the, uh, the American coasts, east, that is uh, really populated. And that the world is a place where we, humankind, are unevenly distributed. Just imagine this. The f it took 10,000 of uh, tens of thousands of years to reach the first billion. When did the first billion human beings come? Around Napoleon, 1810. Then it takes 110 years to reach the second billion after ASF was founded. So, so imagine, I mean, ASF is founded in a world that has between one and two billion inhabitants. My mother was born before the second uh, billion uh, came in 1930. I was born before the third billion, which came in 1960. I'm, I'm born in 1957. Uh, mind-boggling for me to think that there was less than three billion inhabitants because since I was born a new billion inhabitants have come every 12 and a half years and we're now seven and when I uh, statistically pack my last bag around 2045 or so there will be some somewhere between 9 and 10 billion inhabitants on the world. So in my time, world population will have tripled. It has never happened before in human history, and it will never happen again. So population growth is perhaps the most decisive factor in the 100 years also 
of ASF history. The United States has become much more popular. So has Scandinavia, not to speak of uh, Asia, Africa, Latin America. The second factor is, of course, economics. The nearly all uh, nations and peoples have had phenomenal economic growth. The blue nations here are, are the richest uh, and most industrialized nations. The blue, however, are now between 10 and 100 times richer than the yellow, which are the poorest. So again, one of the decisive factors is that there has been phenomenal economic growth on the planet, but it has never been more unevenly distributed. My country, Norway, with uh, some $60,000 uh, per capita income, is now not 10 or 20 times richer than the poorest. We're 100 times richer than the, 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 the poorest nations here marked in yellow. Still, you know, when the UN tried to sum up the, the, the 40 years where they really had systematic data, they found that indeed it's been more than a generation of continuous growth and progress. 40 years of progress, as they called it. This, was, uh, this is uh, the report of the UNDP on human development from 2010. You will see that uh, each nation has a trend line. How, how do they make a trend line and how do they try to, to measure development here? They look at um, education, existing and expected education, they look at life expectancy and health, and they look at purchasing power, economic ability to, uh, to, uh, to feed, to, uh, to develop uh, yourself and your family. Of the 135 nations where they have data, 132 has had progress since 1970. And most have had phenomenal growth. China has had 1,200% uh, growth in purchasing power, economic growth, in these 40 years. Um, most nations have had phenomenal um, life expectancy increase. Uh, child mortality is down. Education is up. Economy is up. Still, I would say, as, as one who has now traveled to more than 100 countries uh, on behalf of the UN, and on behalf of the Red Cross, uh, uh, my government, uh, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, it, it is both important to recognize that the majority of us are much better off than at any time before in human history, but the distance between me, as a UN envoy or, or a Norwegian, and the widow uh, I met in Darfur 2006, has never been bigger. Um, we have never had such an affluent uh, uh, world, middle and upper class, but the poor is, are as poor as they, as they have been since the Middle Ages. And of course, that is among the biggest challenges of our generation. And after 100 years then of, of summing up progress, the bottom billion inhabitants have to be lifted up. And the good news is that we now are to three billion people, most Americans, most uh, Scandinavians among them, that have an ability to share, to, to, to help in bringing 
the bottom billion, the bottom two billions up. Let's look at a few other uh, positive trends. What about war and peace? Well, uh, I'm not going all the way back to uh, to uh, foundation of ASF in, in, in 1912. We're looking here at the post-Second World War period. And you will see uh, the number of conflicts growing until from 40, uh, 45 to 1993, then a sharp decline in the number of wars uh, until around 2003, 4 Now, a certain rise since 9-11, war on terror, and new wars in Afghanistan, and Pakistan, uh, Somalia, and elsewhere. But uh, we have around 35 conflicts now, 55 in, uh, in 93. We have had progress. Unfortunately, many of those conflicts, 35 remaining conflicts on our watch, seem to be exceptionally protracted. So to, 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 to realize our uh, humanity's biggest aim, world peace, is, seems to be a, a, a goal very far into the distance. And, and in, the, in this year of many anniversaries, uh, I would also like then to mention the Oslo Agreement, which has its uh, 20th anniversary. Ambassador Gero Pedersen uh, here, here present, uh, was uh, not in the photo, but here, but uh, in the room when this, the official photo of the secret signing ceremony between Israel and PLO took place 20 years ago in the government guest house in Oslo, 1993. Uh, at that time, we thought we had the roadmap for peace at last, also between Israel and the Palestinians. We were wrong. The Oslo Agreement was slowly but surely uh, brought to an, a standstill by enemies on peace on both sides. However, and back again to the good news, there is no doubt that wars have become less bloody and the wor world has become less violent in recent two generations. You, you will see uh, the, um, the chart to the left, average number of battle deaths in war in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and the last 10 years, and the trend is clearly down. Wars, there are not only fewer wars now, than 20 years ago, they also less bloody. And if you correlate that with world population, where many more people with fewer and less bloody wars, you find out that the number of battle deaths per, per year, per million inhabitants, has gone down so sharply that you can now surely say, we've never had a time where fewer people in relative terms are killed by violence in wars, uh, in armed conflict. Which is in contrast to the image we often get when we look at the news and we see one conflict after the other unfolding. What about terror in all of this? This is the image which uh, brings back, uh, back very bad memories for me and everybody who was in the United Nations at the time. Because this is the headquarters in, of the United Nations in Baghdad, Iraq, 2003. The bomb exploded on the day I took up the job as an Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, and it killed um, one of my predecessors, Sergio Vieira de Mello, a good friend who called me from Baghdad just before this happened. You, the United Nations was completely unprepared 
as was America uh, at 9-11 for this kind of international terror. International terror has increased in terms of international networks able to exert uh, political violence against innocent civilians, but in the number of actual terror acts, the world is, also, is still much better in, than in previous periods during uh, the Rwanda or, or the Pol Pot or, or all of these other tremendous massacres and genocides, which was terror against civilians. So uh, uh, the world has had a new threat, which is internationalized uh, terror, but violence is fortunately down. What about democracy? There are many, many trends we're, we're, we're going to go through. Democracy has be, be had a, the, the best progress ever in the last generation. Now, again, an anniversary this year, uh, the, the uh, women's vote in Norway, my country. I think Finland and Norway among the first in the world to give uh, a general vote for not only men, but women. So democracy is a relatively recent thing, even in Scandinavia. It took, and here's again trend lines, it took until the fall of the Berlin Wall to turn uh, the, the, the world from being dominated by dictatorships to be dominated by democracies. So basically here, the blue line, democracies, the yellow line, dictatorships. When I went to school in the 1970s, 50% more dictatorships than democracies. The youth that are now on ASF, ASF scholarships can boast of living in a time where there are twice as many democracies as dictatorships in the world. So the longer trend of Latin America going from right-wing military dictatorships to democracy, Eastern Europe from com communist dictatorships to democracy, is now followed by all, all of these um, despotic Arab leaders falling one after the other. Uh, of, of these five, now it's only Assad left, uh, ben Ali of Tunisia, Mubarak in, in Egypt, Saleh in, in Yemen, Gaddafi uh, uh, in Libya have gone because people said enough is enough. Does it mean that we have democracies in these places? No. It will take time to build democracy in the Arab world just as it took time for democracy to be built elsewhere. But the trend line is positive. The trend line is also possible in terms of capital punishment. I found this, uh, this, uh, th this uh, very interesting graph of, of the death penalty in Europe. If you go back all, all, all the time back to the, to the 1800s, you would see that all European countries had death penalty in their, uh, in their um, laws, and a majority carried out executions. Since the Second World War, the number of, of European countries carrying out execution has dropped to the point that there are hardly any country now, perhaps Belarusia, the only one carrying out executions. And nearly all, nearly all, have abolished the death penalty altogether. In my view, a great stride for civilization. And I look forward to the day that the last also state in the United States uh, abolish the death penalty. The trend line is very clear. We go, we're, we're, we're making progress in terms of human rights and in terms of international justice. It was, would be science fiction when I studied law at Berkeley in 1982 
if somebody had said, listen, in 2013, a clear majority of, of, of countries in the world will have ratified uh, the uh, Rome Statute, which, which means that they recognize the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court in The Hague, where uh, warlords from many places of Africa face um, justice, and the first ones have been handed down justice. Um, what you see now is that the, nearly all Latin American countries, all European countries, ha half of the African countries have ratified this. What we're waiting for is the big powers, the US, Russia, China, and India to do the same. And it's interesting, of course, to see that if you're a great power, you feel you have a choice. If you're a small power, you feel that perhaps international cooperation is the safer way for us in an unsecure world. I wanted to end, perhaps, by going through a few worrying tendencies. I mean, I, I, I hope I've been able to convince you that in this century, and especially since in the last generation, we've had massive economic development for the vast majority of nations and peoples. We've had enormous strides for democracy. We have had enormous strides for human rights and international uh, justice. And the world has become more peaceful and far less violent than it was. Which are worrying uh, trends? Well, one of them, in my view, and, and an underestimated trend, is international organized crime. I, uh, I, I, I uh, use this world map uh, produced by the United Nations uh, Organization for, for Drug Control and, uh, and, and uh, ag against organized crime. You will see all of these arrows of um, cocaine from Colombia, fr uh, opium and heroin from uh, um, Afghanistan, but also a lot of uh, tr uh, roads, routes of uh, smuggling of, uh, and trafficking of people, uh, arms, drugs. I think it is an underestimated problem. The drug industry is estimated to be bigger than the car industry in the world in, in turnover. So, I mean, the drug cartels, the, 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 uh, the uh, illegal uh, transactions in, uh, involving narc narcotics, which is totally black, is as big as the car industry, which is nearly totally white. It's underestimated. So is the human cost. Uh, more people die in the drug war between, car, uh, between drug cartels and between the, the cartels and the army and the police in Mexico than in the, uh, the uh, Afghan war and, and uh, most other big wars combined. Many thousands each year die in Mexico, in Colombia, in Haiti, in Guatemala, and for that matter, in Western Africa. An us underestimated problem that we, we, we should deal with as a community of nations. When I came to Colombia as a 19-year-old, driving with friends a car from Chicago in the United States to Panama in Central America, 30,000 kilometers at the time, and then going on to work with, among others, this Indian tribe in Colombia. I didn't know there was a war in Colombia. This war, which has become more intense since the 1970s and is now in its 50th year, and Norwegian diplomats are now trying to end it, I was there uh, as, a, as an envoy many years after working as a volunteer in a Catholic relief organization. I was there as an envoy for the UN in the 
the last peace effort to this one. I mean, in all of these years of war, there has been massive uh, civilian suffering, and the fuel for the war has been the drug industry. So the Indians that I uh, worked with in the jungle as they went from hunt being hunters to farmers in, 19, um, in the end of the 1970s were, became refugees as the drug cartels took over their jungle uh, 20 years later. There is fuel for conflict through international crime. Now, the final uh, challenge that I'd, I would like to um, uh, discuss with you is climate change. And it is interesting uh, to see that in many parts of the world, including in the, in the United States, there is still sort of debate, is there climate change? I saw, uh, I saw the news this morning, somebody saying, yeah, well, uh, of course, it's still very disputed. I don't think it's very disputed. I, 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 this are, these are temperature, um, the world average temperature measured since 1950 to 2010. Is there a trend visible? Yes, I think there is a trend. The world is getting warmer. Uh, it, it is very visible. Um, and the, 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 the world average temperature is leading to natural disaster increase. So the graph to the left is registered, um, registered natural disasters by uh, various databases. And if you then, uh, in, in the beginning, maybe the data were not that good. Actually, this is the century of ASF that is uh, recorded. I don't think it was as low in the beginning of the century, of the last century, uh, as is here recorded, because there were not as good measurements as today. But 1960s and 70s is really commensurate to our time. And we have had a three times increase, three to four times increase in the number of natural disasters, because there is more people living more exposed to more extreme weather. So uh, Mayor Bloomberg saw it after Sandy, because one hurricane is not enough to prove climate change, but the accumulated number of, of natural disasters show that things are going in the wrong direction, and we need to change it. Again, also another, another uh, interesting example f for you as Americans and for us as Scandinavians is the ice cap in the Arctic. I mean, the, the, uh, the uh, 2011 uh, and now again, apparently now 2012 and 2013 are together with 2007 the lowest measured ever, ever, of ice in the Arctic. The ice is melting completely. And you can now, as you see to the right here, uh, you can, uh, uh, you're, you're able, in, in, tw in 2011, you could do both the Northeast and the Northwest Passage, navigate from, uh, from uh, Europe to Asia which means that the, the race is on, not only for, for navigating these uh, vulnerable seas, but also for the oil and the gas and everything which is in the, in, in, in the high north, uh, in areas that is not fully established in terms of jurisdiction and ownership, and whom can exploit what. Now, to meet all of these problems that are still there, uh, uh, remaining wars, remaining social injustice, the bottom billion uh, problems, 
um, Syria war. I was just myself in Syria, in Aleppo city, and saw the devastation of the worst war of our time, and nobody's doing anything to, to stop it. You know, we need to change the international political architecture, in my view, if we are to meet the future challenges, including climate change. And one of these examples of, of a, a reform screaming to happen is reform of the Security Council. Uh, when I was the UN Under Secretary General, I had regular briefings to the Security Council, uh, tw 20 or 30 altogether, and it was very evident for me and my staff that it was the wrong composition around the table. You know, uh, the world's most populous nation in to be soon, India, is not even a permanent member. Uh, the biggest country in Europe, Germany, not a permanent member. The second biggest contributor to the UN system, Japan, not a, not a member. Uh, except when they are elected in competition with all, uh, all other nations on the world. For that matter, Brazil, the biggest nation of Latin America. The reform of the UN system to reflect the world as it is in our time and not the world as it was in, in 1945 has to happen. And we have to then have world leaders realize that they need to cooperate. Uh, it is a breakdown of international relations that they cannot agree on how to deal with the, the hemorrhage of human lives in Syria that I could see myself uh, as we came to Aleppo the day after Scud missiles had leveled whole, qu whole quarters, uh, uh, blocks of apartment houses. Uh, parents were retrieving their dead children from the rubble when we came. And there is no action to stop it because there is no agreement in the UN Security Council to, 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 to act. Nor is there sufficient international agreement to meet climate change. So even though we're making big progress, there are some big uh, question, uh, question marks. And I wanted to just to end by going back in history to the early days of, of ASF um, history, if you like, and, and commemorating our own uh, countryman, Fritjof Nansen, who in, in the 1920s became the first high commissioner for refugees. At that time, there were uh, tens of millions of stateless after the First World War. These are among the people that he helped in Russia, Ukraine. There were stateless all over Europe, as there were in, in Russia and, and Ukraine. What did Fritjof Nansen do? He, he thought, I need to be creative. And he made the Nansen passport. And I often uh, go back to that time to show that, you know, there is a possibility still to be inno innovative. They were, they were in the 1920s. Nansen was. This is France saying, we recognize the passport Nansen, and, and they gave it to tens of thousands of undocumented illegals. Something we could learn from, in my view, both in my own country, Norway, when we're not able to deal with the problem, and I know you're discussing it, uh, what to do in America as well. They could handle it at that time. We should be able again. I am ending here, and we will have, uh, I think, time for, uh, for, for questions and discussion. I remain an optimist. It is amazing what happened in my lifetime in terms of progress, economic, social, technology, uh, international assistance, peacemaking, 
in most situations. Syria is the exception. I think uh, 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 th there are many good examples of the world coming together to do good. So what cannot the next generation do that is now receiving ASF scholarships to go both to Scandinavia and come from Scandinavia to go to, to here? They have bigger resources. They have better technology. They have more education. They have their better knowledge. They have better tools than we had. And I also think they will not fail uh, as we did on many of the issues that I have mentioned. So I remain an optimist, uh, not only for ASF, but for international cooperation. And I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you.